Gennady Ivanov, artist, wanted to capture some of the impacts of climate change in a region of Canada that has experienced some of the highest warming rates on the planet, the Yukon Northwest Territories and the Canadian Rockies. He was able to join scientists from Global Water Futures as they made visits to some of their observation stations and study sites. One of the first locations visited was Wolf Creek Research Basin in Yukon, where automatic weather stations were first set up more than 25 years ago in an area where there was initially low shrub vegetation. He painted small pastels in the field in April 2019 to capture his first impressions of the landscape. In earlier years, there would have been more snow cover. The red hues reflect the taller shrubs, which are now growing prolifically. In fact, the whole ecosystem has changed. The wolves, which still live in Wolf Creek, have been joined by other predators, such as lynx and coyote. The snowmelt season is shorter. Stream flow involves heavy summer rainfall events that cause flooding. It's a different place after a quarter century. In this large oil painting, produced in Gennady's back studio and based on his field paintings, photographs and memories, he shows one of the automatic monitoring stations which was set up over bare ground in the 1990s, now overwhelmed by the invading red shrubs. The scientists have kept the equipment in its original location in order to record the modifications produced by the vegetation close to the ground. He has painted the red shrubs like flickering flames, consuming the instrumentation and warming the surroundings. They carry black seeds of continuing invasion. The title of this painting is The Red Invasion of Wolf Creek. As we journeyed north in April, the recent pattern of very early ice breakup in creeks and rivers was occurring. As Gennady worked on this field painting of Quill Creek in Yukon, he could hear the cracking of the ice. He calls this painting Quill Creek Cracking. The ice on deep Kathleen Lake in Kluane National Park in Yukon was still thick enough to walk on when Gennady painted this pastel during a tremendous hailstorm which produced the stripled effect of the painting. Landlocked salmon live in this lake, the population of which has experienced large fluctuations in recent years, possibly as a result of interactions between climate change and hydrology. Unraveling the reasons why requires good scientific observations and further study. The mountains near Haines Junction, Yukon, are the front ranges of the high mountain ranges upon which sit the extensive St. Elias ice field. These field paintings show the spectacular changes in their hue at sunrise and sunset. He produced a larger oil painting of their sunrise appearance in his studio. One of the most amazing sights near Haines Junction was a glacier consisting of rock. This large oil painting attempts to illustrate it. When the ice in a valley glacier has mainly melted or remains in vestigial form, the rocks which were once carried in or on the glacier remain. They have been added to by rocks falling from the valley sides. The rock debris is stippled a remnant of the former ice flow or result of continuing slow movement. Walking up this kilometer long crawling tongue of rock is an uncanny experience. Gennady was inspired by the rock glacier in Kluane National Park to produce this large oil painting of a ghost glacier. 
Sitting above the ribbon of rock is the ghost of a glacier, shrouded in snow, resuspended by the wind from one of the north-facing sides of a mountain gully. In the foreground are the waters of Desjiash Lake, which is still drip-fed by water flowing beneath the rock glacier. A large oil painting, which he calls Icefall, produced entirely from Gennady's imagination as he remembered the sights on the ski plane trip up to the St. Elias Icefield, which spans Yukon and Alaska, the third largest ice field in the world. In the field pastels he painted on St. Elias Icefield, he tried to capture the ancient ice sculpted forms of the distant mountains. The immensity of Mount Logan in the distance and the diminutive figure of Professor Pomeroy helped him appreciate the scale of the ice field behind only Antarctica and Greenland in area. The St. Elias mountain range has lost around 50% of its ice cover in the last 50 years, but still feeds outflow glaciers which are themselves retreating. One of the glaciers fed by the St. Elias ice field is the Kaskowolsk Glacier. Seasonal meltwater from this glacier was a major source for Kluani Lake. The rapid retreat of the glacier led to piracy of these waters by another valley, depriving the lake and exposing large areas of lake bed. Where once there was lake water is now silty dust. Gennady has titled this large oil painting, The Desert on the Lake. This field painting, titled Plundered by Piracy, shows the result of the dramatic act of piracy on water. Over the space of four days in 2016, the 150 meter wide Slims River all but disappeared. It is now possible to walk across the former lake bed to what was once an island. This is the first known example of human induced river piracy associated with climate change. These two field paintings of scenes looking across the still frozen Kluani Lake from a viewpoint at Destruction Bay evoke sad memories of the impact of the catastrophic drop in lake level on the lives of the local indigenous people. The harbor which was used for their fishing boats is now stranded and useless, severely impacting their traditional practices. Destruction of a way of life at Destruction Bay. Gennady also produced a large oil painting to represent his feelings at this change in a way of life. Beyond the frozen lake are the mountains on its eastern shore. In the foreground is the dark, drying mud of the now redundant harbor at Destruction Bay. As we drove northwards from Whitehorse to Dawson City, we passed through a vast area, 45,000 hectares of forest near Fox Lake that had been destroyed by fire which raged in July 1998 and smoldered into the following spring. The burn is still a scar, but in this large impressionistic oil painting, the small trees of slow regrowth provide some greenery. With climate change, burns are becoming more frequent and wildfires are reaching intensities and extents never before experienced in Western Canada. This field painting captures the scene at the bend of the Yukon River near Five Finger Rapids. A channel of surface water is bisecting the ice cover on the river. With climate change, river breakup is occurring much earlier in the year, and this is one of the earliest breakups ever recorded. It is downwind of Five Finger Rapids at Dawson City where the time of ice breakup has been recorded continuously for 123 years by gamblers in the City of Gold. This field painting shows the tripod on the ice, which, when it moves, is the indicator of breakup. This year it moved on April 23rd, the tie for earliest date in the whole record. North of Dawson City, in Tombstone Territorial Park, 
we were struck by the extensive reddish hues in the landscape, from shrubs which were increasingly encroaching onto former open, sparsely vegetated tundra. If Gennady had produced this field painting in earlier years, at this time of year, 17th of April, he could have expected to paint continuous snow cover, but not now. This large oil painting is from Gennady's memories and imagination of the trip so far. He's called it Transitions. A retreating glacier, pockmarked by rock, mud, and silt, overlooks a lake. These represent transitions in the hydrological cycle. The title also acknowledges the transitions which local communities are having to make in response to these climatic changes. This is another large oil painting from Gennady's memories and imagination. This one is entitled The Sorcerer's Snowscape. It occurred by magic overnight when paint which he had left to dry ran down the canvas. The accident produced an image which is redolent of many of the landscapes which he saw. As climate change is leading to dramatic increases in temperature in the Yukon, trees are establishing themselves further north and at higher elevations. As we traveled northwards on the Dempster Highway, especially where the terrain channeled the wind into favored directions bending the trees, they looked as if they were marching slowly northward. Marching Trees is the title of this large oil painting. As we drove up the Dempster Highway from the Yukon into the Northwest Territories, there were spectacular views of the Richardson Mountains, notorious for their howling winds and blizzards. This year, following recent snow-laden Arctic storms, the wind had scoured snow from the ridge tops, leaving deep snowdrifts in the valleys. The snow-free ridges in this large oil painting give a hint of an early spring after the end of the Arctic storm season. These two field paintings were produced using gouache and mud collected on site. Gennady wanted to capture how melting of the permafrost is changing the landscape. On the south-facing bank of Caribou Creek, melting of the subsurface layers is causing the bank to collapse. Mud oozes out at the bottom of the slope, and the sliding bank takes trees with it. This is only April, and there is collapse in Caribou Creek. Gennady painted two large oils in his studio, one a triptych. He calls them impermanent frost. When the permafrost is ice rich, the scars left by sliding, melting slopes can include exposed ice. On warm days, water cascades down the slope from the melting ice. Vast swaths of landscape seem mobile. Such sights have prompted the chief of the Gwich'in indigenous people to proclaim that climate change was, quote, like watching a nuclear explosion in slow motion." Unquote. As we continued our journey towards the Arctic Ocean, Gennady's mind was cast back to a field painting he produced much further south near Haines Junction. He calls this pining at the edge of Pine Lake. It is a view looking northwards at the end of the lake. The stooping trees appear to be bowing in sympathy at the plight of their cousins further north. Back to the north, in the zone where there is now widespread permafrost thaw, the soil in which tree roots are embedded becomes mobile and loses adherence to the subsurface. On slopes, the soil and trees slide away down slope. Where the ground is flatter, the trees lean and topple over willy-nilly. Some trees survive and grow continuously with the new growth being vertical. Others just collapse or die from being waterlogged. This is a large oil painting of such drunken trees. Trail Valley Creek Research Station, north of Inuvik, Northwest Territories, was established in the early 1990s by Environment Canada. 
It has grown into a large, well-instrumented research facility. Wilfrid Laurier University has played a major role in its development and maintenance, and Dr. Phil Marsh of this university maintains research in this site to this day. This field painting shows some of the station, including sleeping accommodations and field laboratories. We are now back in the Canadian Rockies in Alberta. Gennady has titled these two paintings Changing Palette on Pato. The Pato Glacier is one of the most intensely studied glaciers in North America. It has receded rapidly and at an accelerating rate since it was first monitored at the beginning of the 20th century. The recession has produced a changing palette of colors, more grays, browns, and sludges as the ice vanishes. The helicopter landed on a bank of mud not frozen, but sticky and cloying because of the exceptionally warm spring. The suction required extra thrust for the helicopter to be freed. This is a large oil painting of Pato Glacier. The glacier is named after Wild Bill Pato, who is one of the first wardens of Banff National Park. The title of the painting is Wild Bill Wouldn't Recognize It. The glacier has lost more than 70% of its volume in a little over 100 years. This is a view from just below the snout of the current glacier. In the foreground, where once there was ice, are now banks of mud and silt, mixed in with growing accumulations of blackish cryokinite, which forms on the ice surface and is washed off into these accumulations by the annual meltwater flush. One of the most spectacular locations for a Global Water Futures monitoring station is beneath the soaring peak of Fortress Mountain. In April, we were dependent upon snowmobiles to access the site. As we waited for this support at the base station, Gennady painted these two pastels to capture his first impressions of the spectacle. Gennady has given this large oil painting the title Fortress Mountain Now. The lowering peak overlooks the automatic monitoring station. Recording atmospheric and ground conditions in such complex terrain is difficult yet important to be able to model future conditions resulting from climate change. Gennady wanted to record this scene because for him it summed up the effort the scientists go to on behalf of the world. This first field painting was produced on our April visit to the Fortress Mountain site, and the following two he painted in August. Although patches of snow are still visible on the peak, the mountain's summer continents is entirely different to that in winter. Gennady was very struck by the words of the Gwich'in chief when he described the impacts of climate change on his people's land in the Northwest Territories as, quote, like watching a nuclear explosion in slow motion. This is his attempt to paint that in this large oil of the Fortress Mountain Research Site. This explosion has started at the site of the Global Water Futures Monitoring Station on the edge of a cirque which was once home to a glacier. Even Fortress Mountain can be stormed. One of the most iconic sites in the Canadian Rockies and far more accessible than Fortress Mountain is Lake Louise. This scene will have been photographed millions of times, but he wanted to try to capture the immensity of the landscape in a field painting. Looking beyond the frozen lake supporting hundreds of tourists, one can see the small Victoria Glacier, a diminishing shadow of its former glory. This is particularly pertinent on a geological timescale 
the immensity of Victoria Glacier's former power is apparent from the deeply scoured U-shaped valley. Even the vestigial glacier may vanish by the end of the century. Gennady's title, Wanning Power, seems too puny to describe the story of this landscape. Gennady's trip to parts of Canada which are experiencing so much change because of climate change in the company of scientists who are making an immense effort to measure, understand and predict has created an enormous impression on him. It has fired his imagination and will forever remain in his memory. He has produced a series of oil paintings from his many memories and imagination. He remembers special light when dark clouds were accompanied by winds which resuspended snow particles. He remembered glimpses of watermelon snow colored by red algae which blooms in melt water which is becoming more abundant with increasing temperatures thus reducing the albedo of the snow. He remembers the sights and sounds of melting ice. He remembers his dismay when learning that some people deny the evidence of scientific measurements and analysis. In his painting, The Denier and the Bear, he portrays a denier convoluted in position and one of the Global Water Futures monitoring stations from which such consistent measurements come from. The Trail Valley Creek Station in the Northwest Territories is depicted along with its support tents. He also paints a polar bear, a species which, to many, is iconic of the threat climate change poses for animals. He has supplemented this already impressive weaponry, but he needs all the help he can get. In August 2019, Gennady returned to Canada, this time to the Canadian Rockies and east into the, into the Canadian prairies, including the province of Saskatchewan. He joined scientists to see glaciers completely unobscured by seasonal snow cover and at the height of the melt season. He also saw some of the impacts of major hydrological events related to climate change in the prairies. The Athabasca Glacier, which is an outflow glacier from the massive Columbia Icefield, as one of the 60 study sites for the Global Water Futures Program has installed automatic weather, snow and ice monitoring stations. The glacier has lost around half of its volume and its snout has retreated by about 2 kilometers in the last 125 years. It is currently melting downward at 6 meters per year. In August 2019, the exposed ice surface was crisscrossed with crevasses, mill holes or moulins, and deep meltwater channels rivers of meltwater born on a dying glacier. The ice surface had a reddish purple hue from deep purple algae, a component of a material called cryokinite. These are some of the features he has tried to capture in three field paintings. The melting is dramatic and he wanted to capture some of the drama in two large oil paintings. This one he calls Athabasca Annihilation, showing a deep meltwater channel. The second oil has the title Deep Water. At this time of the year, liquid water was flowing, swirling and cascading down its solid form. He also returned to the Pato Glacier in August, its shrinking form much more evident without snow cover. Global Water Future scientists used drones to photograph and sense the receding glacier. A brilliant sunny day on the glacier meant that his field paintings were amongst the most colorful he had ever produced of a glacier. Despite the bright colors, the bare moraines and sediment left by the retreating ice gave him a sense of destruction, darkness, and decay, born in rapid deglaciation due to human-caused climate change. In this painting is an example of the strange formations of cryokinite below the glacier snout, washed off the glacier by meltwater and accumulating in many mountain ranges up to two meters high. This field painting looking down the valley from the current glacier snout gives an impression of the former scale of the glacier. 
At the base of the glacier were melt caverns about two meters high, here captured in a field painting. Here he represents the crisscross patterns of crevasses and melt channels on a glacier in an impressionistic way. This large oil painting is called Collapse. Looking down from a position on Pato's lateral moraine, two meltwater caverns with roofs several meters above the water are collapsing as we watched, testifying to the extent and rapidity of the melting of the glacier. The floating ice indicated there was flow from the right hand to the left hand cavern. The water is probably part of an expanding subglacial lake beneath the lower part of the glacier which extends beyond the glacier snout. This oil painting, entitled Birth of a River, Death of a Glacier, represents the overwhelming impression made on Gennady by his summer visit to the Pato Glacier. Another oil, called Pass Pato, reproduces the impression given in the field painting looking down the valley from the position of the current snout, looking at a former, much larger and more powerful glacier location. Cryokinite is a strange material which consists of ash, soot from wildfires and air pollution, dust, algae, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other organisms. It collects on the surface of the glacier and has been increasing over the years as greater wildfires deposit more soot which feed the algae and microbes, darkening the glacier and contributing to increasing melt rates. Summer melt washes some of it into hot spots on the ice and then off the glacier surface altogether where it accumulates in weird formations below the snout of the glacier. A vital part of the Transitions Climate Art Project is discussion with scientists, not only in the field, but also in reflection. This conceptualization of a breakfast conversation with Professor Pomeroy and Professor Davies occurred the morning after our exhausting day in the Pato Glacier. On the table is an accumulation of cryokinite. Scientists from Global Water Futures are examining its composition by various techniques, including scanning electron microscopy and DNA sequencing, and showing how it is accelerating glacier melt and ultimately sea level rise. One of the most fascinating outcomes of conversations with scientists has been my growing realization of how interconnected the world is and how something that is very small can affect the whole planet. For example, the connection between the rate of melting of ice and the material which accumulates on the glaciers. This material can be studied through the technique of scanning electron microscopy, which produces images at typically around 10,000 times magnification. These worlds within worlds oil paintings are based on SEM images of cryokinite samples from the Pato Glacier, collected and analyzed by global water future scientists. This normally unseen micro world has profound impacts on our own Earth. The accelerated glacier melt caused by these microorganisms even contributes to sea level rise around the world. On the journey eastwards across the Canadian prairies, Gennady came across a dramatic consequence of climate change in a time before humans were disturbing the climate system, on which we rely on for our support so rapidly and seriously. This field painting shows the rock layers exposed in Drumheller Canyon, which was gouged out by torrents of meltwater 10 to 12,000 years ago as the ice in the last ice age retreated. The exposed rocks were laid down during the age of dinosaurs and have yielded many magnificent fossils. This sequence of field painting I've called a short sojourn on the South Saskatchewan. Hundreds of miles to the east of the Rockies, some of the meltwater from the mountains flows through the Canadian prairies in the South Saskatchewan River. The stream regimes in the Canadian prairies are also changing because of climate change and human use for irrigation and hydroelectric power. 
Pronounced floods and droughts, which are leading to earlier and more frequent vegetation fires, are increasing in frequency and intensity, with implications for agriculture, infrastructure, and transport. The worst floods and droughts since colonization of the region in the late 1800s have occurred in the last two decades. The South Saskatchewan River flows through the city of Saskatoon, the home of the University of Saskatchewan, and headquarters of the Global Water Futures Program. The slumping banks of the river and the changing pattern of sandbar shows evidence of shifting patterns of erosion and deposition in response to the most recent hydrological changes. The best way of seeing this evidence is from a canoe, and this series of pastels illustrates the changing views, very different from the sculpted landscape of the Rockies, painted on a 12-kilometer sojourn on the river downstream towards Saskatoon under the paddle power of scientists.